Previously in this series, we talked about how the dualities of the brain integrate to create narratives, and how our egos, our personas, the very essence of human consciousness, is composed of these stories. To very briefly recap, the dorsal stream and the right brain translate behavioral patterns into visual imagery, which the left brain and the ventral stream can then arrange into linear semantic structures. This means that dominance and duality is not restricted only to the brain, but emerges in our physical realities as well. Interestingly, the orientation of this duality gets inverted at the interface between inside and outside. In other words, while the left dominates on the inside, the right dominates on the outside. In the last video, we talked about this in terms of the prevalence of right-sided dominance. Whether it is a hand, nostril, ear, or eye, the right side tends to dominate in human biology. And this unilateral dominance isn't just restricted to our physical bodies. The spatial directions right and left are very clearly associated with positivity and negativity, where right is good and left is bad. We talked last time about how the Latin word for left is sinister, which in modern day English means forbidding, evil, or criminal. What wasn't mentioned in the last video is that in archaic English, the word sinister also used to mean on the left-hand side in a coat of arms from the bearer's point of view. In other words, the right as depicted. This is a fascinating and direct linguistic reference to the orientational inversion that occurs as inside flips to outside and left flips to right. When a spatial direction is intrinsically linked to an abstract concept like this, it is known as an orientational metaphor. And there is some very interesting neuroscientific evidence that strongly supports the relationship between right as positive and left as negative. But keep in mind that the right on the outside equates to the left on the inside. In the brain, the left cerebral hemisphere increases its activity in response to smiles and decreases its activity in response to disgusting or fear-inducing stimuli. In contrast to this, the right cerebral hemisphere becomes more active in response to negative emotions, like anger and anxiety. Take another example as evidence. If you'll recall from part 3 of this series, we talked about the phenomenon of motion-induced blindness, or MIB, which you can experience if you stare at the green dot in the center of the screen. When you stare for long enough, the yellow dots will start to flicker in and out of your conscious perception. And this is thought to occur because the left and right hemispheres, or the dorsal and ventral streams, process reality in conflicting ways. The left hemisphere chooses a single possibility from the many and ignores or denies the others, which causes the yellow dots to disappear. MIB reappearance is attributable to the right hemisphere, whose discrepancy detector cognitive style assesses all possibilities, and therefore disagrees with the biased decision to ignore the bright yellow stimulus. This relationship has been supported by experiments in which shorter disappearance times in the MIB illusion are related to anxiety, depression, and trauma. In extreme cases, severely stressed or traumatized people simply do not perceive a disappearance of the yellow dots at all. On the other end of the spectrum, longer disappearance times are associated with positivity, excitement, and euphoria. In support of this, practiced meditators tend to experience longer intervals between the disappearance and reappearance in MIB. Amazingly, very experienced meditators, like Buddhist monks, can maintain the disappearance of the yellow dots indefinitely. While the conceptual relationship between left and right is interesting, there is a broader point to be made here. Orientational metaphors exist in other directions, too. Positivity and negativity are also associated with up and down, respectively. And this relationship emerges clearly in our language. As just a few examples, positive and negative can literally mean upward or downward on a number line. To be in high spirits is to be happy, while a put-down is an insult. And to bring it back to the beginning of this video, the word sinister doesn't just mean left, evil, or forbidding, it can also mean underhanded. The duality between up and down seems to arise for the same reasons and from the same brain asymmetries as the duality between right and left. Indeed, some scientists theorize that the left and right brains do not just mediate positivity and negativity, but dominance and submission, a fitting suggestion in the context of this series. In this regard, dominance refers to the position at the top of a hierarchy, while submission refers to the positions at the bottom. And like most things we've covered in this series, there is neuroscientific evidence that can explain why this is the case. Recall that in part 4 of this series, we talked about the motor and sensory homunculi, the little men that represent our neural somatotopic models. In other words, maps of our bodies that are spatially arranged in our brains. 
Our brains also contain what are known as semantic homunculi, topographic maps of how concepts, objects, and language relate to the body. So for example, the words throw and javelin might activate the arm and hand regions of the semantic homunculi, while the words run or shoes might activate the foot and leg regions. Interestingly, there is some overlap between the motor and semantic homunculi, which means that certain parts of the brain process both the actual motion of body parts and concepts that are related to those same body parts. In other words, there are regions of the brain that become active both when you move your hands and when you think about the word glove. What's particularly interesting about this is that there is less overlap between the motor and semantic homunculi of the lower body than there is between the motor and semantic homunculi of the upper body. In addition, the overlap between the motor and semantic homunculi of the lower body only occurs on the right side of the brain. This basically means that the left brain, and therefore the ventral stream, is less connected to the lower parts of our bodies than the right brain and the dorsal stream. In addition, when compared to the left brain, the right brain is more connected to the body as a whole, and especially connected to autonomic functions like breathing, and the more stereotypical movements of the lower body like walking. Therefore, from our perspective, left and down are conceptually associated with negativity, while right and up are associated with positivity, which is why we need a pick-me-up when we're feeling down, and why the left is sinister, but the right is dexterous. The evidence explored in this video supports a theory known as embodied cognition, which states that all human knowledge is inherently associated with and structured by the sensory-motor relationships within our bodies. In other words, we can only acquire knowledge through our behaviors, and whenever we use that knowledge in the future, it is remembered in relation to the part of the body through which we learned it. Indeed, the entire concept of orientational metaphors can be explained by embodied cognition, because if all knowledge is intrinsically connected to specific parts of the body, then all concepts are inherently associated with a spatial direction. This idea has some deep and powerful implications that we will explore in the next video. But for now, we can say with confidence that orientational metaphors draw a direct link between the asymmetries that exist in our brains, bodies, and conceptual spaces. To express this in the verbiage of the current video series, dominance and duality is evident in our physical being, in our conscious vision, and in our subjective realities. In the next and final part of this series, we will call on all of the previously reviewed evidence to explore how the very core of our being, the self, is inherently given shape by dominance and duality. I truly appreciate it if you've stayed with me for the duration, and I hope you've enjoyed the journey. Stay tuned for the conclusion to dominance and duality, and thank you for watching The Paradox Perspective.